on World News Tonight. Troubled trust. Crisis for the British Prime Minister deepens as more of her lawmakers resign. New escalations. Martial law declared as citizens in annex regions evacuate under state orders from President Putin. Deep freeze. Millions of Americans prepare for the Arctic blast that continues to cause freeze warnings. Where's Abruta? An electrifying show expresses emotion through a non-verbal performance. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We start off tonight with breaking news. Liz Truss has resigned as UK Prime Minister in a statement outside Downing Street. She said she could not deliver the mandate on which she was elected as Tory leader and had notified the King that she was resigning. There will be Conservative leadership elections to be completed within the next week. She also says that she will remain as a Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. It comes after she met the chairman of the 1922 Committee of Backbench MPs as more Tories called for her to quit. Truss's premiership came under renewed pressure after the Home Secretary resigned and a chaotic vote on fracking. There was fury around the vote and the methods used to get the MPs to vote with the government. I recognise though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. This will ensure that we remain on a path to deliver our fiscal plans and maintain our country's economic stability and national security. I will remain as Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. Thank you. Britain's Interior Minister quit on Wednesday, levelling a thinly veiled criticism of Prime Minister Liz Truss as the UK's leader pushes back against lawmakers openly calling for her to resign. Suella Braverman confirmed she was stepping down from her cabinet job in a letter shared on Twitter. On the face of it, she said she was resigning because of a breach of protocol, sending an official document from her personal email to a parliamentary colleague. But the resignation letter included this, seemingly aimed at Truss, quote, pretending we haven't made mistakes, carrying on as if everyone can't see that we've made them, and hoping that things will magically come right is not serious politics. She added, quote, I have made a mistake. I accept responsibility. I resign. Braverman's departure means Truss has now lost two of her most senior ministers in less than a week, both replaced by politicians who had not backed her for the leadership. Mr. Speaker, I have been very clear that I am... The latest drama to hit the British government comes just hours after Truss faced a raucous session in Parliament and pushed back against her critics. The Prime Minister was met with laughter, boos and jeers. Here's the leader of the rival Labour Party, suggesting that after a tumultuous six weeks of whipsawing policies, Truss ought to resign. So why is she still here? Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I am a fighter and not a quitter. Truss has been fighting for her political survival since she launched a mini-budget, an economic program of vastly unfunded tax cuts on September 23rd that sent shockwaves through financial markets. Uh, it's a great office to state. I'm obviously honoured to do that role. Getting- Grant Chaps replaced Braverman in a bid by the Prime Minister to bring critics into the fold to try and quell a rebellion which is growing in size. Truss's Conservative Party is some 30 points behind the Labour Party, according to opinion polls, and YouGov ranks her as the most unpopular leader the pollster has ever tracked. And on an update on the solitary Hong Kong protest, the victim who was protesting outside the Chinese consulate in Britain said he was dragged inside the grounds by masked men, kicked and punched in an attack British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly described as unacceptable. The UK government has condemned the treatment of a Hong Kong democracy protester who was seen being pulled into the Chinese consulate in Manchester and beaten. On Wednesday, Foreign Secretary James Cleverly called the incident unacceptable 
and he has summoned the deputy Chinese ambassador. Uh, Greater Manchester Police are conducting an investigation. Um, we, I will need to see the details of that investigation before we decide what other action that we might take. But we have made it absolutely clear to the uh, Chinese embassy that this behaviour is unacceptable. The incident took place on Sunday as a group was protesting Chinese President Xi Jinping's rule. Social media footage showed a demonstrator being dragged inside the grounds of the consulate by masked men and assaulted before police finally pulled him out. The protester, Bob Chan, had recently emigrated from Hong Kong to the UK. He held a news conference on Wednesday alongside British MP Ian Duncan Smith, during which he said he feared for his family's safety. Let me say it again so it is clear. I was dropped into the consulate. I did not attempt to enter the consulate. I now have bruises on my eye, my head, my neck, and over, all over my back. I fear I may be silenced by the powers that be. I fear for the safety of my family. China has disputed Chan's version of events. Manchester's Chinese Consul General Zheng Xian wrote to police accusing protesters of storming the consulate grounds. Beijing also said it had lodged representations with Britain about, quote, the malicious harassment incident. Over in Ukraine, President Vladimir Putin ordered all of Russia to support the war effort in Ukraine with martial law in place. As the Russian-appointed administration of Kherson prepared to evacuate the only regional capital Moscow had captured during its invasion. First, Russia illegally seized and annexed four regions of Ukraine. Now tonight, Moscow is turning them into police states. President Vladimir Putin imposed martial law across large sections of eastern and southern Ukraine, the emergency powers covering about 20 percent of the country. Under the law, Russia can confiscate Ukrainian homes and property, move civilian populations by force, and raise local militias, meaning Ukrainians in Russian-occupied areas may be pressed into taking up arms against their own country. Vladimir Putin finds himself in an incredibly difficult position. It seems his only tool available to him is to brutalize individual citizens in Ukraine. The Ukrainian government called on people living under Russian occupation to ignore the martial law. But that may not be enough. Tonight, Russian television showed these images of Ukrainians already being deported from occupied areas. Last month, Russia held referendums in the four occupied parts of Ukraine subject to the new law. Witnesses say the vote was fraudulent, at times held at gunpoint. Members of the European Parliament, meanwhile, awarded the 2022 Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought to the brave people of Ukraine, represented by their President Vladimir Zelensky, elected leaders and civil society. The European Parliament is awarding one of Europe's highest tributes to Ukraine following the breakout of war in February. Dear colleagues, it is my privilege to announce that the 2020 Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought has been awarded to the brave people of Ukraine, represented by their president, elected leaders and civil society. It was a consensus decision by all the presidents of the political groups in the European Parliament. For the past nine months, the Ukrainian people have been defending their country by fighting at the front, supporting each other and by enduring terrifying waves of bombardment. That's why, according to the Parliament President, Roberta Metzler, nobody deserved the prize more than the Ukrainian people. But MEPs see in the battle for Ukraine a much larger meaning. The Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought is Europe's highest tribute to human rights defenders. Established in 1988 and awarded annually, it's named in honour of Soviet physicist and political dissident Andrei Sakharov and comes with €50,000 in prize money. The other two finalists were WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and Colombia's Truth Commission, which aims to establish the facts behind human rights violations in the country. Meanwhile, Russian soldiers have arrived in Belarus for joint training exercises, prompting worries that the two allies could launch another attack on Ukraine. 
A military welcome for the latest unit of Russian troops arriving in Belarus for training with their hosts. Some 9,000 Russian soldiers are expected to be stationed in Belarus for what are officially described as exercises. But the move has prompted speculation in the West that the maneuvers could be preparation ahead of a new incursion into Ukraine. There are also concerns that there could be a mobilization of Belarusian reservists, concerns that are dismissed by senior military officers. All the fake information that's now published in various internet channels, it's not reliable. There's no reason to worry about it. Citizens will be summoned to the military commissariat, the data will be noted, and they'll depart to their place of work or place of residence. Mobilization in the Republic of Belarus is not being carried out. But Ukraine isn't taking any chances, especially as attacks against it have been launched from Belarusian soil. It's reinforced its defences along the border, with special force troops training to counter any move by a joint Russian-Belarusian operation. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Severe temperatures are currently affecting almost 90 million people in the United States. The frigid blast is blanketing parts of the Midwest in snow, especially in northern Michigan and Wisconsin, where a storm knocked out power for thousands and forced schools to close. Less than a month into fall, a frigid blast blanketing swaths of the Midwest in white. And tonight, leaving 86 million Americans across 25 states under freeze alerts. In particular, parts of northern Michigan and Wisconsin slammed with more than a foot of snow, whitecaps crashing on the Great Lakes. The storm knocking out power for thousands and closing schools, its paralyzing impact stretching into Illinois and Indiana, where roads today were impassable. Snow falling as far south as Kentucky and Tennessee. The system's powerful punch landing more than two months before the official start of winter. East of the Rockies, temperatures are 10 to 25 degrees below average. Even seasoned locals shudder. Countless families forced to crank the heat just as heating bills are expected to hit a 10-year high, leaving some left to wonder whether this unseasonably severe cold snap is a sign of brutal winter weather to come. President Biden is taking new actions against rising gasoline prices, a move that could also fuel the fortunes of Democrats facing headwinds over inflation. U.S. President says his latest action is not politically motivated. The economy had, has animated voters as a top issue heading into the midterm elections now less than three weeks away. With inflation a top worry for voters just weeks before the midterm elections, U.S. President Joe Biden announced Wednesday a plan to sell an additional 15 million barrels of crude oil from America's strategic reserve and said more would be released if it was needed, all in an effort to dampen high gasoline prices. It comes two weeks after OPEC rankled Biden by siding with Russia and agreeing to a production cut. That raised fears of a new spike in prices at U.S. pumps. We're going to continue to stabilize markets and decrease the prices at a time when the actions of other countries have caused such volatility. U.S. presidents have little control over oil prices, but with the country's massive gas consumption, the highest in the world, high prices can be political poison. Biden said domestic producers should be using record-breaking profits to invest in production. Prices are falling, he said, but not fast enough. My message to the American energy companies is this. You should not be using your profits to buy back stock or for dividends. Not now. Not while a war is raging. Biden assured the nation's drillers that the government will swoop into the market as a buyer if prices plunge too low. He said his aim would be to replenish oil stocks when U.S. crude is around $70 a barrel, a level that would allow companies to profit while still being good for taxpayers. The U.S. benchmark was around $85 on Wednesday. The announcement underscores just how much world events like Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February have upended Biden's plan to move the country to a fossil fuel-free future. Biden said America must both invest in oil production and clean energy. So I'm asking the Congress, pass a permitting bill to speed up the approval of all kinds of energy production, from wind to solar to clean hydrogen, because we need to get this moving now, quickly, now. 
Oil companies and Republicans are pushing back on Biden's plan, saying the president is tapping the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, or SPR, for political reasons and not because there is an actual emergency. America's Strategic Reserve is now at its lowest levels since 1984. It is more than half full with more than 400 million barrels of oil. Enough, Biden said, for any emergency drawdowns. Flooding in Nigeria has been recorded as the worst in over a decade in the country, with over 600 people falling victim to the torrential pours and lethal streams caused by the overflow. This used to be the east-west road in Nigeria's river state. Now, people wade through it, balancing what's left of their belongings on their heads. Large areas of rivers and 32 other states are being inundated by the worst flooding in over a decade. It has killed more than 600 people, displaced around 1.4 million, and destroyed large swaths of farmland. Experts like Hiba Barud, an associate professor at Vanderbilt University, say all areas of society are being affected. There are entire systems of not just uh, households, but also critical infrastructure, social systems, economic systems, uh, education, healthcare, all these systems are impacted at the same time. And so this will lead to um, uh, devastating losses at various aspects of life. Authorities are blaming the flooding on heavy rains and water release from a dam in Cameroon. Barud also points to global warming and poor planning. We have climate change that is making these hazards more intense, more frequent, but we can also do something about it to reduce our vulnerability by improving our protection system, by improving, uh, upgrading our infrastructure, improving our uh, mitigation uh, strategies, planning for resilience ahead of time. She said a Nigerian dam meant to backstop Cameroons was planned but never completed. Nigeria has ranked among the worst in its readiness to adapt to climate change, according to the 2021 Notre Dame Global Adaptation Index. The U.S. economy is in apparent danger, according to various market leaders, including Jeff Bezos, who voiced on his Twitter his concerns on the current economic slowdown. Amazon.com founder Jeff Bezos became the latest business leader to warn about the health of the U.S. economy, telling his Twitter followers late Tuesday to, quote, batten down the hatches. The tweet was in response to comments from Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon, who said in an interview that it was, quote, time to be cautious, referring to the state of the economy. Later in an interview, Solomon said there is a reasonable chance of a recession in the U.S. next year, but that it's not certain, saying it was possible inflation could be tamed by the Federal Reserve without it causing too much economic pain. Solomon's comments echoed those of J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon, who said last week that the U.S. and the global economy could tip into a recession by the middle of next year. But Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan was more optimistic after reporting earnings earlier this week, pointing to the healthy finances of consumers and businesses. Global economic growth has slowed due to higher interest rates amid rising inflation and an energy crisis in Europe, and signs the Fed's aggressive rate hike path may be starting to crimp what has been a resilient labor market were beginning to appear. Microsoft this week became the latest U.S. tech company to cut jobs or slow hiring after a media report said it laid off under 1,000 employees across several divisions this week. Meta platforms, Twitter, and Snap, the maker of Snapchat, have all either announced job cuts or scaled back hiring in recent months. Billionaire Elon Musk also said his electric car company Tesla needed to cut jobs, warning colleagues in early June that he had a, quote, super bad feeling about the economy, though he later tweeted that total headcount would increase over the next 12 months. On Tuesday, ratings agency Fitch Ratings said the U.S. economy will face a recession starting the second quarter of 2023, but robust U.S. consumer finances will help cushion its impact. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute.
The World Health Organization says COVID-19 is still a global health emergency. WHO Chief Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said that it is too early to lift the highest level alert for the pandemic. The United States is still open to dialogue with North Korea despite the regime firing about 100 more art artillery shells towards the maritime buffer. Bombs inside parcels exploded at Myanmar's biggest jail, prompting soldiers to return fire in a confrontation in which at least eight people were killed. An armed anti-junta group claimed responsibility for the attack. New Zealand farmers gathered in city and town centres across the country, driving tractors and pickup trucks and carrying signs in protest against the government's plan to tax agricultural emissions. After torrential rains left a trail of destruction in Venezuela's central Aragua state, the focus shifted to clean-up efforts, evacuation and damage assessment. Rescuers evacuated surviving pets from the disaster area while entire families with their animals walked through the muddy streets to leave the town. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight with visuals of Fuerza Bruta, an electrifying theatrical show originating from Argentina that has returned to Seoul. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.